Welcome everybody, George Allen here with another Bitcoin Cash Builder interview. I'm here today with Chris Troutner of Fullstack.cash. Chris, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks for hosting me, George. Uh, it's my pleasure. Uh, glad to hear you're doing well. So, Chris, uh, for those of us, uh, for those in the audience who don't, uh, maybe don't know much about you, uh, can you just tell us uh, about yourself and what you do? Yeah, I'll give you my my quick uh, sort of Bitcoin history. I love that everybody in this space sort of has like an origin story. Uh, so my origin story is that I learned of Bitcoin about the same time as Andreas Antonopoulos in 2009 on Slashdot.org. Um, that's where the white paper was published. And this was like, if, if I'm, it's hard to recall exactly because at the time you, you never realize that you're in a historical moment when you're in a historical moment. Uh, but I think it was around June 2009 when I first uh, spun up the Bitcoin client and started uh, mining Bitcoin with my home computer and managed to mine uh, a block. Uh, so I had 50 Bitcoin because um, that was a block reward back then. And uh, so probably from 2009 to 2013 is when I sort of stepped away from the Bitcoin uh, community um, and I sold those first 50 Bitcoin for $300. I thought for something that just like I didn't pay anything in, it was just running on my computer while I was at work. I thought that was a good deal. But that's mm -hmm. my that's my Bitcoin pizza story. And uh, uh, so I kind of, you know, watched Bitcoin grow, but but there were things I, I was always about the technology and but it was the the, the way the community sort of grow grew that that sort of turned me off from it and and why I kind of left the space and then um, I was working on a totally different idea um, about uh, in that would have been 2017 early 2017 I was building some software that would let uh, it would, it's peer-to-peer -peer virtual computers so I could have like my Raspberry Pi and I could rent that out to you and I needed uh, like a financial layer, and uh, and I started using Open Bazaar um, as that sort of financial layer. Um, but then the big price spike happened in 2017, and then the Bitcoin Cash fork happened, and so I turned my focus into helping Open Bazaar um, add Bitcoin Cash support to their platform. And I did a lot of testing with them. I worked closely with Chris Pacia, and. Um, so that's how I got into Bitcoin Cash. I wasn't actually part of like the original fork people. I was just I was a business owner trying to solve a business problem, and I was attracted to it for those reasons. And uh, but that work uh, eventually led to me getting hired by Bitcoin.com, uh, working with Gabriel Cardona to launch uh, Developer.Bitcoin.com and the Bitbox JavaScript library. And then in March uh, 2020. Uh, there was uh, a, a pretty big layoff just due to the bear market and then coronavirus hitting. Um, and that's when I left Bitcoin.com to start Fullstack.cash. And it's just a continuation of the work I was doing at Bitcoin.com. Uh, Fullstack.cash is blockchain as a service. So what we do is we work with exchanges and we work with app developers so that they can just focus on building their app and, and doing the thing that provide that lets them provide value and create money. And we abstract away all the, the nitty gritty details so they don't need to worry about the differences between running BCHN versus BCHD. They don't need to know or care what an indexer is. They don't need to try and maintain SLPDB or like wonder why it fell over. We handle all that. We just provide one REST API, which is one convenient language agnostic layer and l documentation that, that a business can can use and they don't need to understand all the tech that happens below that layer like I said they can just focus on their core value proposition so that's that's the main idea behind full stack dot cash um, we're growing steadily uh, it's great I mean we're, we're growing there's there's two uh, like main threads in our growth. One is the growth of the entire ecosystem. So as the entire ecosystem grows and more businesses join Bitcoin Cash and want to get their apps on Bitcoin Cash, they're looking for solutions like what Fullstack.cash offers. But then also we're, we're getting better known within the Bitcoin Cash community. And 
So my focus has really been on developers and uh, in particular hackathons and uh, in helping get, get knowledge of the tools out there because I know that those developers you know, have the potential to go on to build bigger apps and then, and then make recommendations to the companies paying them that, hey, you know, you should use these full stack.cash tools. That's, that's, mm-hmm. that's basically my strategy. So I've, I've been uh, pretty active in the, in the Bitcoin Cash hackathons the last few years. Um, this last coin party hackathon was my first time as an as a actual like, competitor, as an entrant. I've always been like, either a mentor or a judge. And so it was, it was really different being able to actually compete. And it was a lot of fun. And you, you guys, your team built uh, Purely Peer, which is, um, well, how do you describe? And you guys won that hackathon, basically. You know? Yeah, I yeah. That we was won. a really great app. Yeah, you thank know. you. Yeah, we won the grand prize. It was $8,500 was the, was the prize. And the great thing about that, I wasn't in it for the money. I was, my main motivation there was to show off the tools that we used, which was all the full stack.cash tools. Um, and so what was really great about that experience is that uh, it was a team of five and we were all there for a different reason. Um, one of the other team members was uh, Daniel, who is a Venezuelan developer that uh, has worked for me for the last couple years. And so he was in it primarily for the money. Um, and uh, his share was a significant life changing amount of money there in Venezuela. And he's been saving up for a house. So so I was really, really happy to to you know, just sort of show him off in terms of get, you know, get him a little street credit, but then also get him this sort of life changing money. Um, Eric, who is the team leader, he's the idea who came up with the idea for Purely Peer. And um, he has a much bigger vision, which he is, he is going on to pursue uh, in terms of actually creating like a Purely Peer economy and these sort of closed economic loops. And it's, it's great, but we just, we just captured like, steps one two three in the, the app that we built called geodrop.cash and that's the the web url if anybody wants to play with it at geodrop.cash and uh that's just like the very first baby step down a longer road which is that purely pure vision but the idea behind the geodrop is it's a map based scavenger hunt game um similar to pokemon go and the sort of canonical use case for it was a coffee shop that says that you know wants to advertise itself to the crypto community they could drop like free coffee or free bagel pins around their neighborhood and then the players uh they go to the geodrop.cash it's also an android app and uh, you can pull it up and see if there's any sort of treasure hunts in your neighborhood and so you you physically walk to like near this location and then you can pick up the the slp token and so in the case of like a free coffee uh, token, you could then go to the coffee shop and redeem the token for, for a free coffee. So that's like the basic idea. But I think, you know, what captured my interest and I think the reason why we won um, is because if you think about that use case, it doesn't take very much to like start to realize like dozens of slightly different use cases that that can be used for. So it was really the flexibility of the idea that I think captured people's imagination. So I'm really looking, I'm, I'm personally just focused on fullstack.cash and the services we offer there, but I'm really cheering on Eric and, um, and looking forward to what he ends up doing with the pure, purely peer idea. Cool, cool. So you mentioned uh, fullstack.cash get, uh, provides uh, basically a REST API that makes it um, you know a lot easier for people to build on Bitcoin Cash. So um, I've, I've seen some uh, concerns recently about, for example, SLP infrastructure not being reliable. Do you do SLP as well? Yeah, SLP is a huge focus. And um, so for people who might not be aware who are watching this, I was one of the original creators of Simple Ledger. My name doesn't really appear anywhere because I was more of a behind the scenes guy, but I was in the room uh, like like SLP. Um, there's actually a great video on YouTube. I can give you the link for where we we talked about these these early history about a year into the, the SLP token. Uh, economy growing we decided hey we better get all the original people together in a room and like tell our story so that's there on youtube for anybody who wants to 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 hear it but the short version is that 
um, Yonald Fuqual and uh, and uh, uh, a few other early people like came up with the idea and the specification, and then, and James Kramer worked with them to really sort of get the 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 original idea, like the the mechanics of it and the mathematics and the cryptography behind it. Uh, onto paper, and then James started running, James Kramer started run, actually coding it up and making it a real implementation of it, and right around this time, um, the team that I was part of at Bitcoin.com with Gabriel Cardona, we were focused primarily on Wormhole, which was another token protocol that was, um, well, it was centralized in its development, not really in in its implementation, uh, but but uh, Bitmain fell on on hard times at that point. Like their IPA st- IPO started going south, and uh, the team behind that, that that was building the reference implementation got defunded. So Wormhole Protocol was you know died pretty quickly, and this up and coming SLP protocol was was sort of there. And Gabriel had made a really uh, wise decision to. To focus on both of them in case something like this happened to one of them, uh, always mm-hmm. a wise decision in crypto is to not put your all your eggs in one basket. And uh, so that's really how the SLP protocol, you know, got started. And it's been this hockey stick growth like ever since, you know, for the last three years. And running SLP infrastructure is really um, tricky uh, because it's not a minor validated token so there's essentially like it's almost like a second layer technology essentially the the validators they work on top of the bitcoin cash chain but they're they're not um they don't play by exactly the same rules and things can kind of go uh you know that that's how things lead to token burning and um anyways a big focus of full stack.cash is, is just staying ahead of that curve and uh, providing reliable slp token infrastructure I'm very closely following the work that James Kramer's still doing with uh, BCHD and integrating the SLP indexer into that. I think that's really um, important work. Uh, one of the the things that I think gets lost around the SLP infrastructure is there's there's trailblazing. There's like finding new ways to do the same thing, adding new features. That's important work. But then scaling and, and running the infrastructure in an industrial setting that's what I've always done that's what I've always focused on and that's really important work but there it's not sexy at all everybody would rather just not think about it which is what makes full stack that cash valuable is I do all those things that nobody wants to think about and uh, so there I mean the we're not out of the woods and I don't think we ever will be it's it's like Andreas Antonopoulos says that like the minute you solve scaling you need to solve scaling because because it's it's always a you're always trying to get to the next level there's no there's no done point there's no finish point you're always trying to scale to the next order of magnitude Mm -hmm. so you said that um basically since slp uh got off the ground uh that it's basically been hockey sticking what do you think is driving this growth what what what's the special appeal of uh simple ledger protocol tokens Oh man, I could talk for hours on that one, but to try and nail it down to like a couple specific things, one one thing that's really driving it is the simplicity. It's uh, you know the the, the word simple is is not is not just marketing. Um, it is actually like probably the simplest token uh, like concept or protocol for managing tokens that has ever been created. Uh, it's it's not dependent on Bitcoin Cash that that protocol can can actually work on several different blockchains as they are today without any modification, and I th- that was I mean that was really the the reason why it was the clear winner on top of Wormhole is Wormhole had this uh, centralized development team and when the funding ran out uh, you you couldn't just keep using it um, because it was tied to the full node, whereas we made a decision early on with SLP to have the indexer decoupled from the full node so that so that if the you know that sort of 6 month full node schedule that we had at the time wouldn't impact um, SLPDB SLPDB like its release schedule would be completely independent from anything that was and you could point it at any full node whether it was BU or or ABC at the time or BCHN now or BCHD 
Like it was originally designed uh, as like its own standalone software. And I think that was a really good early decision. Um, now that things are more mature, uh, you know, James has been working hard on that BCHD uh, implementation. So it's actually putting the, all the SLP stuff right into the node. And there's advantages to doing that. It really, uh, you have to look at your use case and how you're using it to really like make a call as to whether that's good or bad. Um, but it's, it's, I'm, I'm all for more diversity. So anyways, being simple and, uh, and decoupling the, the indexer from the full node schedule, those were like two really good early decisions that I think really helped SLP grow. Um, and then, you know, the spice token took off and that was, um, like no one was pushing that other than the spice team. That was just like a handful of guys who were like having fun. And, and it, you know, that's, that's the thing that I see over and over play out in the crypto spaces. The people who have fun have the most success. People are attracted to fun. They like fun. People want to have fun. That was like our whole focus when we made the geodrop.cash app was it had to be fun. It had to be a game. Uh, and lighthearted and whatever else it became down the road, like whatever. But it, it needs to start by being fun. And uh, and so SLP tokens are fun. And that's another, I think that was another like sort of the trifecta there. The, the, the third big ingredient that made it really take off is that those tokens were really fun. And, uh, you know, and now it, it's, that's the other thing is SLP, like all the other crypto things, is constantly remaking itself you know the slp that we have today is not the slp we had two years ago and it's not the slp we're going to have two years from now um but the ideas sort of remain the same it, it and it changes with scaling and it changes with culture uh but i'm really encouraged with with the whole slp infrastructure we have our challenges ahead of us but it it's shown to be effective it's shown to be valuable um and uh one one thing that i'm really focused on right now is uh, well, I guess to, to, to get back to this question you just asked about why, why did it take off and uh, tokens provide businesses like it, it's like a layer of abstraction. I, hes I hesitate to call it like a second layer, although that's technically correct in some in some way. But um, basically, businesses can build their own tokens for their own business use case uh, without having to worry about mining and in certain cases without having to worry about exchanges and uh and so that's a powerful and compelling idea where you can take all these advantages that a cryptocurrency has of being permissionless and and sovereign uh and uh without having to worry about bootstrapping your own economy worrying about security and mining and mm -hmm. so it's in control systems i would call that like a second degree of freedom mm -hmm. and so it's just it businesses can focus more on what they uh you know how they add value to the to the the network uh without having to worry about you know some more low level details they can just kind of piggyback on top so that's why tokens in general are valuable and uh the slp protocol in particular is interesting because it's so simple it has this potential to um, easily jump between uh, blockchains, and I'm seeing a lot of businesses attracted to that idea right now. This is this is a trend in the in the entire industry uh, of you know Ethereum's doing a lot of this work right now with with wrapped you know Bitcoin and wrapped tokens um, mm -hmm. and moving them like off like from Bitcoin to Ethereum and then maybe like to the Avalanche blockchain. Uh, Avalanche just lock, launched their Ethereum bridge, so th I'm, I'm definitely noticing this new trend in our industry. It's, it's becoming very prominent of, of businesses want to be able to create a token once and then move that token like across blockchains. And Bitcoin Cash is really well positioned because uh, of our transaction fees are so small and we have this mature token ecosystem. And so I can see a one of the trends I'm I'm seeing develop and I think uh, I, I could be wrong on the specifics but I think the trend is there is um, businesses might use a blockchain like Avalanche or Ethereum um, because they have a more mature smart contract for actually 
creating and managing the tokens, like a DAO or something. But mm-hmm. then they'll move. They'll. Pr- uh, this is where I'm speculating. Uh, they'll move those tokens, and the actual main usage of the token will take place on Bitcoin Cash, uh, where the transaction fees are low for for like actual day to day use of the token. Uh, and if we can, if we can build, you know, a robust bridge between the blockchains, I think that that Bitcoin Cash has this really great unique uh, value proposition of of a mature token economy and low transaction fees. That's really interesting. Um, the uh, there's a team that also wants to build a kind of bridge uh, between BCH and Monero, but. Um, you know, we there have been discussions about you know how to make uh, Bitcoin Cash more programmable, right? Because right now, you know, for example, as I think it was Roscoe told me recently, you know, we can do addition, subtraction, and uh, division, but we can't do multiplication on Bitcoin Cash. Um, and so, yeah, it does seem like there's an opportunity uh, to to kind of partner with a smart contract. Um, blockchain so you you've been kind of getting into avalanche right because your approach is kind of uh you know bch uh bcha and and avax right yeah yeah those have been the three blockchains that that i'm pretty focused on just because there's really strong uh similarities i mean bcha and bch are, are forks from the same chain and uh so everything pretty much works the same on both chains there and then uh avalanche is well, for one, they uh, a lot of the members of the uh, Avalanche Labs team are are ex Bitcoin Cash enthusiasts, and so there's a lot of love there um, for Bitcoin Cash, and uh, and it's UTXO based, just like Bitcoin Cash is. So technologically, there's a lot of similarities, and uh, and yeah, so they're funding uh, uh, the development of a token bridge right now that. Uh, uh, through the Permissionless Software Foundation, which I founded, and um, uh, the that that will let us transfer SLP tokens uh, between between the the blockchains between Avalanche and Bitcoin Cash, and then they've also got uh, uh, an Ethereum bridge that they that they just launched. So you can move tokens on Avalanche to Ethereum and back. So when we get our bridge, you'll be able to move a token. From Ethereum to Avalanche to Bitcoin Cash and back, and um, yeah, so it's 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 pretty it's pretty exciting it's pretty exciting technology, uh, and they one of the reasons I took that project on is because I mean it furthers the permissionless software's goal of of sort of focusing on business and focusing on blockchains as a as a means to the end, which is uh, free speech and economic activity. Uh, and uh, but also the their the funds that they're putting into this is is going directly to a Venezuelan developer uh, who's doing the bulk of the work. And uh, I I've been really active. I started I started uh, when I was working at Bitcoin.com. Um, I took ten percent of my paycheck and I sent it to uh, Eat BCH. And I did that for about a year. Uh, and I just love how they. Um, are using Bitcoin Cash to, to, to feed people in Venezuela. And then at some point I decided I really wanted to make a difference in one person's life. And, uh, and that was Daniel. I hired him and I've been mentoring him for a couple years now. And, and we're, uh, we do a lot of good work together. He's an excellent developer. And so uh, this was an opportunity for me to extend that to another person. So it, it's great to have uh, another Venezuelan developer who is uh, making life-changing money and, and able to still live and work from Venezuela. So, so that's the other side. Like that's the the, the more humanitarian, non-technical side of this whole avalanche bridge. <laughs> uh, so it's it's a win-win for everybody involved so far. Interesting. And you mentioned the Permissionless Software Foundation, which is something that I believe you founded. You kind of architected something uh, innovative that in, involves SLP tokens. Can you tell uh, the audience a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, the context is that it was, I, I, I didn't call it the Permissionless Software Foundation at the time, but this idea of creating a decentralized autonomous organization, a DAO, on the Bitcoin Cash chain, that was what got me into tokens in the first place and working with Gabriel Cardona and working with Wormhole and then eventually moving to SLP. So the seed of this idea 
existed before SLP tokens. And so I've always been pursuing SLP uh, as a means to this end. And so um, the Permissionless Software Foundation is really trying to push uh, the, the cutting edge of all this token technology, particularly on Bitcoin Cash. And as a result, I, am, I always warn people like, yes, we have a token. It should definitely not be considered an investment. I'm very like explicit, like this is an experiment. It's probably going to fail. We're intentionally out there on the cutting edge where things break. Um, we're not trying to like save anybody's money here. So don't. So if you buy a token, expect to lose your money. Um, everything's an experiment. But by sort of taking that stance, it gives us the freedom to, to really push on the edges. And um, so, for example, one of the innovative things that we've been doing from day one with the Permissionless Software Foundation is we don't need an exchange. Uh, our token trades freely. It's, it's perfectly liquid with Bitcoin Cash. You can move in and out of the token in Bitcoin Cash at any time. And we, uh, we do this through an app called the Token Liquidity app. And it's, it's actually based on Bancor, which is a, an Ethereum-based company. They came up mm -hmm. with this idea. They had a white paper, and they're they're considered a decentralized exchange, um, which is not technically correct, but we can just go with that. But they have this innovative smart contract system that lets them basically act like a decentralized exchange. And I copied that idea very early on um, and built this token liquidity app. So it's it's just a very it's it's not a smart contract in that it's not on chain it's just a javascript program i can shut it down i can start it up um and uh but um essentially it, that's all it does is if you send it tokens it sends you bitcoin cash if you send it bitcoin cash it sends you tokens and the exchange rate is like very well defined on this mathematical curve and uh, everybody gets the same fair rate and the math is such that, like, you can't ever take all the Bitcoin cash out of this app. Like, the, the more, if there's a panic, which we actually saw in November, a lot of people wanted to hold Bitcoin cash. They didn't want to hold tokens in order to be prepared for the fork. Mm -hmm. So there was a run on the, on the PSF token market. Like, everybody sent in their, Bitcoin, or their, their tokens to get Bitcoin cash out of it. <laughs> and, um, and so it was a real, like, trial by fire. And the app just worked beautifully it it uh it just kept adjusting the exchange rate and it gave a worse and worse uh exchange rate as as the the bitcoin cash got drained from it which was exactly what it was supposed to do and uh you know as a result we were able to weather that storm and uh and come out the other side and the app still has bitcoin cash in it and we're, we're able to pick up the pieces and keep chugging along so i'm i'm really like no one else is doing this no one else like I, it's open source, and I always encourage people to use it. But it's a very exotic idea, and mm. and so far, like very few people have have really tried to like run with this idea. But I'm I'm pretty proud of it, and I think the results uh, speak for themselves. And it's it's so nice to have an organization that is not beholden to the whims of an exchange. That's really interesting. That's really interesting <clears throat> because yeah, I do think that you know the we over rely on these centralized exchanges um and i think that they're only going to become more and more central points of failure central points of regulation and i was talking with someone today about steam and they were trying to convince me that steam is coming back and steam for me is completely burnt uh for example because um they justin sun leveraged all those f uh steam at on the exchanges to take uh to take control yeah um and so you know when you ha you know it's like it's my money it's at the exchange but <laughs> the exchange could do whatever it wants with it it seems you know that well yeah and there's there's so, it's 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 an attack vector i mean that's what it is is uh that whole steam drama it was only it only could have happened i mean there was like several stages of drama but the very first stage uh where uh a lot of the steam community members tried to like wrest control away from justin sun and then justin was able to tap the exchanges and it was such it all happened in such a short time frame a lot of the exchanges just sort of went with this herd mentality of like oh okay yeah sure we'll help you out justin and uh ended up you know that's how that one specific battle was won by Justin is was sort of through this it, it could not have happened without him being able to essentially trick 
the exchanges into helping him. Yeah. And um, uh, if if that if that one factor had been different, the results would have been very different. Mm. And uh, and so yeah, exchanges are an attack vector, uh, uh, essentially for every single blockchain. And uh, I'm doing. I mean, so so this uh, token liquidity app is one solution to this problem. Another solution to this problem that I'm really uh, researching when I have you know time to just do whatever I want, which is very little these days, is uh, the swap protocol that uh, that Vin Armani created. Um, mm -hmm. Now, the way I want to build it is different, and so it's 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 sort of uh, uh, not accurate for me to call it swap. But the idea that he created of, which was originally an on-chain protocol. It would let people buy and sell uh, SLP tokens for Bitcoin Cash. Everything would happen on chain. It would all be permissionless and uncensorable because it's all on chain. It's a great idea. It's a great idea. And as is, I wouldn't mind seeing it implemented. But, but for me personally, I'd like to get a lot of that information off chain. Uh, and so I'm taking a lot of that protocol and adapting it to fit the interplanetary file system. But I'm getting pretty close with that, with this sort basically, um, uh, and there's advantages to doing that. Um, one is, you know, you avoid chain bloat uh, with all the all the data being on chain, but also it, uh, it furthers this goal of sort of a cross blockchain, being able to buy and sell tokens across blockchains uh, because it uses IPFS and it's not all restricted to just the Bitcoin Cash blockchain. It opens the door to, to to that particular type of use case down the road, but um, but some sort of uncensorable uh, peer to peer uh, exchange, uh, and the thing about the the swap protocol is it's much bigger than just tokens. That's that's one use case is buying and selling tokens. Another one is like bets. Another one is escrow. Um, another one is crowdfunding. Like all of these innovations that that have sort of rocked the Bitcoin Cash world in the last year and a half. These are all possible on the swap protocol, and so I think it just has an incredible amount of potential. Uh, and I, that, that, so that's another thing that could solve this problem with exchanges, it, or just just obfuscate them. I mean, everybody who's been in the space long enough knows that if a government wants to ban a, a cryptocurrency, uh, the the only real like leverage they have is to go after the exchanges. So as people who use and care about these cryptocurrencies, it's in our best interest to to circumvent the exchanges as much as possible. Hmm. Absolutely. So earlier you mentioned that, you know, SLP today is different, much different from two years ago. And in two years, it will be much different. So is that part of your vision for the next two years of uh, SLP? And, you know, what else is, is within what else are you seeing? Yeah. Um, well, you know, some of the most immediate needs with SLP um, has to do with scaling. There's a plane flying overhead. I hope it's not too loud. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, so scaling is, is an immediate issue. Uh, SLPDB um, is a mature software. It's, it's the primary way that the tokens get tracked right now. Uh, James is pushing forward with BCHD, and I think that that is definitely a solution. Um, and it, it, there's no there's but there's not going to be a silver bullet that just solves all the problems. Uh, it's always going to come down to trade-offs and what the specific use case is. Um, I know one reason why James is attracted to uh, integrating the indexer into BCHD is that uh, there's no stack. Everything just happens in a node. That's all you need to do, and everything just works. If you want to build an app, all you need is a BCHD node. There's a lot of a, uh, you know, it's very attractive to have that sort of integrated approach. But mm -hmm. um, because my focus has always been on scaling, like, okay, well, how many millions of requests per day can this software handle? That's, that's the question that I always come back to. And so SLPDB was built and funded uh, for scaling. I mean, it was like that, that really is the best way. If you're, gonna, if you're talking about, millions of users a day trying to use a service like fullstack.cash, SLPDB is the way you do it today. And mm -hmm. um, But as more people make tokens and as there's more token transactions, uh, SLPDB is having issues with scaling. It, it gets bigger. 
And so one short-term solution that I'm focused on right now uh, with fullstack.cache is um, is white whitelists, uh, f- sort of filters. Basically, you can tell SLPDB to ignore all tokens except for what's on this whitelist, this list of, of approved tokens. Mm-hmm. And that's like night and day difference because because running a general purpose SLPDB as more tokens are created and more token usage happens that makes it harder and harder and harder exponentially harder it's almost like an attack vector for for you personally as a business trying to run a, to- a, a, a business using a token mm-hmm. and so I, I think that we're going to see a shift over the next year or two to right now SLPDBs with whitelist filters are essentially like not used at all uh, industry wide but I'm adding more and more support at fullstack.cash to sort of make that shift uh, where, you know, like uh, right now we, we have a whitelist server and we have all these calls uh, or I, I just pushed a bunch of changes to the code where you can, I have like general purpose calls and I have whitelist calls. And so uh, we'll try and keep going with this general purpose, uh, you know, approach as long as we possibly can. It's, it's very attractive. It's wonderful to just know that you can work with every token out there. But the cost of maintaining and scaling the infrastructure is going up exponentially. And mm-hmm. I, I'm having to have this conversation with my clients. Like, I can con- you can continue to use what you want, but expect the bill to, like, double every three months. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, But you can start making efforts right now to start switching to this whitelist. And then it doesn't matter how... Uh, how much adoption we get with SLP, how many tokens are created or how widely they're used, your whitelisted SLPDB is like immune from all that. It's just going to ignore everything except the ones you specifically tell it to focus on. And that makes the costs are already like like one-tenth roughly. Um, I mean, it, it's maybe not quite that much, but that's the trend. Is It's, it's already like roughly ten times cheaper to operate infrastructure um, with that one little trade-off. And so that doesn't work for everybody. You know, like a wallet like Zap it, it needs to support all the tokens. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, exchanges like SideShift, uh, they are only interested in the tokens that they exchange. They could care less about all the other tokens in the network because it's just not part of their business model. Right. And so it's, it's just a, tr- it's just a, a trade-off. Um, but I think that that is probably uh, a short-term trend that is going to continue. And it's a short-term solution to the scaling problem. Interesting. That's really interesting. So that will also kind of raise the uh, the barrier to entry for new coins, uh, new tokens, I should say, right? Because they'll need to be big enough. They'll need to have a, a serious enough investment in the ecosystem to make it past some of these, uh, onto some of these whitelists, right? Yeah, yeah. So there are some things that... that are going to be solved one way or the other by the market. And, um, yeah, one of them is like, how do you get onto the whitelist? That's a, that's a, you know, natural question. Um, and I don't know how it's ultimately like what is ultimately going to be solved by the market yet, but, um, there are a few approaches that are dominant and I think they're all flawed and I have my own solution, of course, but who knows if the market's going to choose that. But so one approach that uh, Bitcoin.com has taken to this is that uh, when they had mint.bitcoin.com, and, and, and I, I helped develop out a lot of these ideas, even if I didn't necessarily approve of, of the approach. Uh, but they, they, I think, started charging. Um, they just did their best to get like token icons into the library, but it was permissioned. And I think that like there was a, a, the route there in terms of scale is to is to charge for that service. Mm-hmm. Um, the SLP Foundation they have taken an approach. They have like just an open source uh, uh, repository where anyone can submit uh, a token. Now that has problems because how do you how do you solve not safe for work type icons? Um, luckily, mm-hmm. there hasn't been a lot of abuse on that front, but there there has been a little bit. Uh, I have worked with James Kramer and the SLP Foundation to draft a specification, and, and right now that's all it is is a draft. Um, but there's 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 two problems here. One is like token icons. How do you get your icon to show up in a wallet? Mm-hmm. Uh, the other problem is you know how do you get your token onto the whitelist? And uh, and then there's a third problem, 
where is once you submit a token how do you change the data like let's say you get a, you want to update the icon how do you do how do you make that that changeable on an immutable blockchain where nothing's supposed to change and so i've got mm -hmm. a draft specification under the permissionless software foundation we have a, a repository where we keep all of our specifications and one of them has like solves all these problems in that uh we found a way to essentially attach mutable data to a token um, like a token icon so you could you could effectively like create a token and then later on decide you want to change the icon that shows up for that token in the wallets and you can just do that permissionlessly on chain and if the wallet follows the specification it all just happens automatically you don't have to have all this like administrative type thing mm -hmm. um, and so that that would solve all three problems because uh, well, it wouldn't necessarily solve the whitelist problem, but if we were able to implement that specification and get our wallet working on it, we'd probably set up a service, you know, for our full stack dot cash whitelist uh, to to get on there. We'd probably charge some nominal fee, like five cents or something. Um, but if we had the specification in place, implemented, it, it would be an it would be like an automatic process. There wouldn't be a, a big administrative overhead, so we could charge very small fees for that kind of a service. Uh, so those are some of the ideas that I have in mind, um, but right now they're all just essentially theoretical. And there's other people like the SLP Foundation and Bitcoin.com working on their own solutions. So it's going to depend on who gets a mature idea to market first, and then whether the market accepts that idea or not. You know, that's that's how this is going to play out. Hmm, that's really interesting. So. Um you know, right now there's some conversation in the community on uh, tokens, but around group tokenization, right? Which is a proposal from BU. And also Jason Dresner has uh, come out with uh, an alternative way of achieving mm -hmm. um, that end. What are your thoughts on this? You know, I've tried to follow these as much as I can, but, but both of those ideas um, are incredibly complex. Uh, I actually just was watching a little bit of dialogue between James Kramer and Jason Dresner. Both are people who I consider far more intelligent than me. <laughs> and, uh, and so it's good to see smart people talking. <laughs> even, even if you can't understand what they're saying, <laughs> it's good to know that smart people are talking. And uh, uh, the, I don't know how it's going to play out. I think like I said, I think one of the main reasons why SLP tokens got adopted and continue their exponential growth is the simplicity of the idea. Mm -hmm. And so without knowing like any of the specifics, I, I would say that those other two proposals, the, the biggest thing they got going against them is their complexity. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I would love to see minor validated tokens. I would I mean, that would solve a lot of these problems like like everything's a trade-off and uh and slp has its trade-offs and one of the trade-offs is you know it's easy to burn tokens i lost five thousand dollars worth of stable coins one time because my wallet oh, just damn. ate them it just made the wrong <laughs> formatted transaction uh yeah that was that was a harsh reality there and we're gonna live with it i mean that's just baked into how the, the simplicity of the simple ledger protocol uh is that's the trade-off and so minor validated tokens would prevent that from happening and that would be really valuable but it's going to come with its own set of trade-offs and attack vectors and scaling issues and uh, so i'm glad that you know i i think we should have multiple tokens i don't think there should be just one token protocol um and i don't think there will be i i i hope to see both jason's idea as well as the the op group uh, idea pursued, uh, and uh, I think that we should have multiple token protocols. And uh, I think that it, it, like like all things, it it just needs to evolve, and the market needs to choose, uh, you know, mm -hmm. what it wants. So, and there, you know, along these lines, there are, there's also another point of view. Uh, which you can probably call maybe the cash maximalist point of view, right? Uh, the people who say, well, Bitcoin Cash should just be cash and, and just that. Uh, and even some uh, someone uh, brought me an interesting comparison of two blocks, one from 2017, one from very recently. The blocks are about the same size. 
Um, but uh, today's block had many fewer transactions in it, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, right. you know, so that raises the question, you know, by having tokens, is that cutting short our, our, our potential as, uh, as cash for the world? Uh, should tokens, you know, should we just form a really close relationship with like uh, Avalanche, for example, and let them do tokens or something? And do you have any thoughts on this? I, I do, actually. I've been thinking about this a lot. And, and you're, you're asking the right question. Uh, people need to be asking that question of like, how do we scale to a thousand times more transactions than we do today? And we can do it. Like the base protocol is available, but, but man, SLP tokens are going to have a hard time doing that. Uh, because, because all of this token data rides in that op return. So I've been mm -hmm. thinking a lot about that op return. And then that's the difference uh, is token transactions from 2017 would be just Bitcoin Cash, like just the coin, uh, you know, with very few right. op returns. But today, the majority of the innovation in the Bitcoin Cash space revolves around the op return and putting little pieces of text into the transaction uh, that, you know, then the SLP indexer stitches all those together to come up with a coherent, you know, ledger of who owns what. And, um, and so this op return data is a problem for scaling, long-term scaling. Uh, but it's also a problem because the incentives are misaligned. So when you pay like an SLP token transaction, you're adding op return data and you're paying a miner to include that data, but you're not paying to retrieve that data from a service like fullstack.cash. I don't make any money, but I still have to run these like really big archival nodes that are expensive to run and getting more and more expensive. Um, and the reason they're expensive is because so much of a block now is op return data. Mm. And, uh, and you pay once to have that data written to the chain, but you don't pay to, to retrieve that data. Mm. And in... Uh, the 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 world where we have you know a thousand so what are we averaging like three hundred thousand transactions a day that's like what like Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash are pretty much on par right now and it's around three hundred thousand transactions per day so if we want to do three hundred million transactions a day uh, op return data it, like pretty much every node at that point is going to have to run as a pruned node. Um, that only keeps like a few blocks and running archival nodes like we do, like like what fullstack.cash does today. Anybody running an SLP DB indexer needs an archival node. Those are going to become, you know, just prohibitively expensive, not only to operate, but also just to like keep operate, to maintain. And um, so we've got, so in this long-term scenario, we need to solve this, not only scaling with op return data, but also the incentives around op return data. And so one of the things I'm slowly exploring is essentially off-chain op return data where you could have an indexer, a very efficient indexer, similar to like Fulcrum and how it does its indexing now, uh, where instead of, um, you'd, you'd basically, you could, you could still use the op return data, you could still write data and then pay for it separately from a separate database, an indexer like Fulcrum that keeps track of this data. And that way the, the pruned nodes can still just, you know, do their thing and operate. They're just going to forget that data. Mm -hmm. And anybody who then like later needs to retrieve this data, like an SLP indexer, would have this second, you know, index, this new indexer, this new service, that all it does is it's just a database for these opportunities. So it, in technical speak, it would be a key value store where the key would be like a transaction hash where you paid to store the data and then the value would be the actual data itself, which now currently resides in the op return. And so that idea, it aligns incentives, it, uh, it solves a scaling issue. And the third advantage of it is that now you have essentially a database that can be... Uh, uh, cross blockchain so you could use this you could have the same database that talks to bch abc avalanche any other blockchain you want maybe maybe ethereum they can all tap into the same you know database and you can share data across blockchain so you could actually have an slp token you don't have to change anything about the protocol as it exists today but that token could interact with with any blockchain 
but it would still just be an SLP token as we know it today. The difference is that you've moved the data from the Bitcoin Cash blockchain Opraturn into like this this blockchain agnostic database. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, there's it's not you know super easy to do. We've got it. There's like uh, you got to worry about incentives. You got to worry about scaling. You got to put it all together in an implementation. I'm thinking through that right now, but but so far I've got like a pretty like clear roadmap and like technical. Um, idea of how to get it done and I, I'm not seeing any like serious issues with with actually like executing on that idea hmm. uh, and so you know I, I have not I've, this is literally the first time I've ever discussed this with anybody <laughs> and uh, and so it's it's a very early idea but but you know so is 300 million transactions a, a day that's that's, yeah. <laughs> that's also yeah. like it's out there a ways <laughs> but that's a very interesting vision that's that's really interesting um that raises so many questions and thoughts um yeah yeah i'll definitely be looking forward to see how that how you develop that over time but you know we we were talking about how slp tokens are not the same today as they were two years ago then they're not going to be the same in two years from now um that's what i mean like like this uh in order to solve these scaling problems uh it's like I always go back, I'll go back to uh, Ethernet. Like what we call Ethernet today is nothing like Ethernet was in the 90s. It's basically a completely different thing. But we still call it Ethernet. And, uh, you know, and I think that Bitcoin is going to be like that. I, I think like, you know, Bitcoin Cash is not Bitcoin as it was in 2009 at all. But we still call it Bitcoin. And it's, it's true to the white paper. It's true to the, the, the protocol, the basic ideas. Hmm. Okay. Well, um, so getting back to something you said earlier about how you had worked uh, with the Open Bazaar people there early on for a while. Uh, I think, you know, everybody was kind of disappointed to see Open Bazaar essentially kind of close their doors recently. Um, I think that we absolutely need a marketplace, a global marketplace or federated marketplace. You know, there have been a lot of conversations about that, uh, where BCH is the currency. Do you have any thoughts on on where Open Bazaar went wrong and where uh, that that kind of marketplace product should should go in the future? Yeah. Well, first, let me start by saying I was really inspired by the project that you and Shamari did for the the Coin Dance Hackathon um, by exploring this idea of an uncensorable marketplace. And um, without going into too many details on that project, what really attracted me to it was that little tweak that Shamari made that I think made all the difference where he had a YAML um, way of describing a web page essentially mm. and separating out the content that is that it that would be highly subject to censorship mm. and the bulk of the content which is not. And mm. so that does not need to go on chain. It's just the the stuff that is in danger of censorship. That's the only part. And so he found a really neat way to do that. And that's that's the kind of innovative thinking that we need, you know, for a, a, a an uncensorable marketplace like Open Bazaar wanted to be. Um, I think that Open Bazaar's biggest problem was just that they were too uh, ahead of their time. They, uh, you know, trailblazing uh, is really expensive. Like if you think of like Lewis and Clark, like blazing a trail to the Pacific Northwest, like. That's an epic journey, <laughs> and, and, and it's <laughs> extremely expensive and dangerous. And, uh, and that's essentially what a lot of these, that's what Open Bazaar's like, entire like, timeline looked like, is they were just constantly trying to do things that had never been done before. And, uh, I mean, today, given the technology, like ha- now having a clear trail that they blazed, having new technology, someone could build some, a clone of Open Bazaar, essentially, like in a few months with a small budget, um, but, but they had to constantly pay that upfront cost of trailblazing and, uh, mm. and it was a very bumpy ride. I mean, so I think, I don't think they could have succeeded no matter what they did because the deck was essentially stacked against them, but we owe them a great debt and, and making that effort anyways. And, uh, and so the idea was there. I mean, when you talk about the specific implementations, Sure, I, I think they made some, some bad decisions, but at the end of the day, 
uh, you know, Brian Hoffman, their CEO, he had to he had to be a CEO. He had to make a call, and and he did. And I think he was an excellent CEO, even if he might have made the wrong call here and there. Um, you know, it just the it, it pales in comparison to the cost of trailblazing. Uh, and I think, you know, I, I think the idea goes on. I think, I think it's almost a healthy thing that, that, that Open Bazaar um, has shuttered its infrastructure because as long as it existed, people could be like, yeah, use Open Bazaar, except, you know, there was, there was just flaws um, because, because the market has, choos- has chosen other things than some of the, the home-built solutions at Open Bazaar, like escrow. That's a perfect example. Open Bazaar had this amazing escrow system, mm-hmm. but compared to the escrow system at local.bitcoin.com, it's pretty clunky. Um, I mean, local.bitcoin.com, you just it's just a web page. Two people go to it. The person who uh, is trying to buy a service, they put their Bitcoin cash in escrow. Uh, neither one of them can take the money out without working together or appealing to the escrow agent. Uh, that mm-hmm. lets the the seller know that you know they're not they're not getting scammed that the buyer actually has the Bitcoin cash and now all they have to do is deliver on the service. I mean that's the idea behind escrow, but the user experience at local.bitcoin.com is just like infinitely more smoother than the experience at Open Bazaar. But o- nobody had ever done it before. They were like they were literally writing like the Bitcoin script to the really low level stuff in order to make it happen. And so that's that's just one example. I could give like ten of these little like super cool features that Open Bazaar had to develop from scratch, uh, with no roadmap or no inspiration, because nobody had ever done it before. And it was because they did those things that ideas like the escrow on local.bitcoin.com were possible because the the knowledge was out there and they could be like, oh yeah, okay, well they're doing it. Let's just look at how they do it and then make it better. And uh, you know, so it was it was death by a thousand cuts. Uh, like that, and uh, and so I'm really grateful that that they they blazed a trail, and I'm also grateful that like the knowledge is out there. So we don't yet know what form it's going to take, but but uh, but the idea of a permissionless, uncensorable, you know, marketplace, it's out there, and it's going to happen. It's going to happen in a lot of different ways. Uh, it's just you know it's going to take a while for the market to decide which one's going to become the dominant one. You know, like there is no Craigslist of crypto yet, but there will be. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, um, just two more questions, I think. Uh, thanks so much for your time uh, so far, Chris. Uh, one is Bitcoin.com. Uh, this is a Im- really important company for the BCH space. I mean, uh, I think they have the best mobile wallet. I recommend their w- mobile wallet to everybody. Uh, local.bitcoin.com uh, is also very important. You know, I would have liked to have seen BCH on local cryptos, for example, but they won't add it because uh, local.bitcoin.com exists. Um, the wallet is closed source. Um, I just, you know, as someone who, you know, has knows nothing about Bitcoin.com, but I kind of look at it and I think, you know, I'm just kind of wondering where is this company headed? I feel like after this, this major layoff thing, uh, things, uh, may have started to go a little bit downhill. Uh, like I get, I get, um, complaints about the, the rest API, uh, at Bitcoin.com. Where do you see? Bitcoin.com heading. Do, do you have any thoughts you want to share on this topic? <laughs> um, they're they're a private company. Um, they don't have a board of directors. They just have Roger Veer, uh, and uh, so it's it's uh, it's it's a it, you know, the structure of the company is very pyramid shaped, and um, so you know they're thank God for them. Uh, right, because like there's no mm-hmm. one, there's no, there's it's Bitcoin.com or you know there is no there is no other there's no there's no Apple to their Google, and yeah. uh, uh, so thank goodness that that they they stay focused on branding and they have a wallet that that works, and uh, so they're definitely filling a, a needed role. Could they be better? Sure, you can point at anybody and say that. Uh, I think what we need is just more businesses. Uh, I think that um, a a business with a board of directors and experienced, you know, management that's not like 
soaked in the blood of cryptocurrency that's just like they're just trying to actually like uh you know that that has like a a, a wider perspective uh in terms of in terms of like thinking outside the crypto bubble and thinking about just normal like use like we need more businesses like that in this space businesses that that just and and this is almost nothing to do with bitcoin.com this is everything to do with with the timeline i you know this overused analogy of that the cryptocurrency market is like the early internet i mean it's it's overused but it is highly accurate i i think i think that we're essentially in terms of timelines we're essentially like in 2002 mm-hmm. like like the 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 2017 was a lot like 1999 where all this money rushed in um but the infrastructure wasn't there uh, mm-hmm. And so all this money rushed back out, and there was a there was a bear market in a uh, a winter essentially. That's what happened in 1999. All this money rushed in, and it rushed back out, and uh, and the bubble popped. But then it was like from 2000 to 2010. That's when we got. Uh, I mean, I'm I might be making a mistake here on the timeline, but that's when Facebook and Google really came mm-hmm. into their own. Yeah. And uh, and became the companies that, that we know now. And I, I think that's where we're at. I think we're going to start to see the next Apple and Facebook and Google's. They're going to come into their own like 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 the we got through that bear market. The money's coming back. The infrastructure is way better than it was. Uh, and and you're going to start to see the big companies like Bitcoin dot com is essentially like I mean, it there's similarities there between them and open bazaar and that they, they did a lot of trailblazing, uh, and they paid the cost for it. Mm. And, uh, and you know, it, it's a small company with a limited set of investors and, and you can really get into a bubble and get into a bad place when that happens as a company. Uh, and, uh, so it's not so much that it's a failing of bitcoin.com. It's just that we're seeing the industry mature and and it, it that's going to happen at its own pace just like it did for the internet and uh and so i'm 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 yeah i i i, I think you know bitcoin.com is doing what they can uh i'm very grateful for them uh because yeah, me you know, too. They, they they paid me for three years and I, I worked hard for them and and uh i look back fondly at my, my time there uh but uh in a sense they're they're almost irrelevant um just just because uh the what we what we really need to see is is you know the onus is not on bitcoin.com to become better it's for bigger companies to enter the space Mm -hmm. okay cool where do you see bitcoin cash now uh three months after november 15th and uh where do you think we need to go what what do we need to focus on well yeah that's a good question um i think there is a um a vacuum with respect to leadership like like as much as people are grateful to in the bitcoin cash space to have to have like essentially gotten rid of abc uh uh in some ways it was uh, the reason they didn't do it sooner is it's often better the devil you know than you don't right and right now we're we're dealing with the devil we don't know and uh and so i'm really encouraged by the level of communication that's happening in the Bitcoin Cash Dev community, I have joined several of the the developer hangouts, and there's a lot of really healthy discussion going on. And uh, I don't know where that's going to lead. And it's really it's the risk, it's the unknown that's the most that's the highest risk at this point. It's not what's known. Uh, right now, things are good. Communication's good. There's ideas flowing, and uh, and I'm encouraged by that. Uh, it's just gonna it's just gonna take time to see and the other X factor here is um, as a community we do not know how fast we need to move you know like the price of Bitcoin cash what just doubled in the last two weeks mm. uh, the you know what if that trend continues like like what if what if the price goes to five thousand dollars? and we 10 or 100x the amount of merchants and users like uh we'll probably we'll probably be fine it's probably going to be a little bumpy but uh but it's sort of i think that's one 
that's how the game has changed. Uh, with uh, with ABC, they no longer have to worry about multiple implementations. They have their own blockchain that they're in charge of. They're a small team. They can pivot quickly, make decisions quickly. They don't need to they don't need to organize all the full nodes together and reach consensus. But Bitcoin Cash does. That's how we've always had to do it. That's how we're going to have to do it. Uh, so just because of that, we're different. We, we can't move as quickly or pivot as fast. And that's a risk. Um, it's not, doesn't mean it's going to lead to anything bad. It just means that that's a, that's a reality. And, and we need to, as the community moves forward and finds its own path and finds its own destiny, that's one of the factors in play. And uh, so I'm really encouraged, and, and, and I'm glad that uh, I'm glad that there's not a lot of, uh, you know, people are really focused right now on just sort of healing the wounds and 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 getting co- maintaining being copacetic and and uh, and and having discussions and, and we're not moving like no one's really like pushing the envelope, especially with regard to consensus changes. So, so that's good. That's good. Um, you know, there's a healthy amount of concern around op group. I think everybody feels similarly to me that we'd love to see minor validated tokens, but op groups, a very complex proposal and, uh, and it, it, it could have side effects and we, and we need to consider that. So I'm really encouraged to see the full node developers, you know, have that attitude and take that approach and have the discussions that they're having. So it's all encouraging and we're, we're in a good place. And, uh, uh, like, like I said, the, the, the biggest risk factor there is really just leadership. If it's, if we're going to be able to maintain, uh, this sort of, uh, consortium of full node developers or it, or if, you know, one particular full node is going to become dominant, uh, the, one thing that has not changed uh, is that the miners still pretty much only use one implementation. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's a big risk. That's a big risk for the price of the coin uh, if there's ever an issue with that one node. So um, I think, and I'm not the only one to point that out. I think you're aware of this. I think everybody in the community that's taken this seriously is, is aware of this risk. And a lot of the other full nodes are like BU's doing a great job trying to make themselves you know, more attractive to miners. Yeah. And, uh, and that's exactly what we need to see uh, in order to maintain a healthy coin. All right, excellent. Well, uh, Chris Troutner, full stack to cash. Uh, thanks so much for joining us today. I think it's been a really, really very interesting conversation. Um, you know, I, I could have gone on for another hour with you, but you know, I know you're on your boat and uh, gonna, <laughs> gonna let you go. Uh, do you want to le- uh, leave any final words, let people know where to find you? Yeah. Um, so the Permissionless Software Foundation, that can be found at psfoundation.cash. And uh, I think you can probably just, permissionless is a hard word to spell. So just type it into <laughs> Google and it'll figure it out. Uh, but um, we're a very business oriented, uh, blockchain agnostic organization. Uh, We're particularly focused on JavaScript developers. That's sort of the language of choice for us. And we're building apps at every level. We're we're trying to build better infrastructure, particularly around tokens. And we're also trying to build really cool uh, front-end apps like geodrop.cash and wallets. And so we definitely want to work with more businesses. We have a, a technical committee meeting and a community committee meeting and uh, our governance is based on the Node.js Foundation. Basically, if you're, if you're a JavaScript developer, we got a lot to offer you. If you're a business, we got a lot to offer you. Uh, we're, we're looking, we're looking to, to sort of build a consortium of businesses in the space. And, uh, and then fullstack.cash is uh, infrastructure for businesses who want to build in this space. Uh, so definitely recommend uh, that. I'm available on Twitter and Telegram. Uh, my handle is at Chris Troutner, one word. Uh, so yeah, I'm always I'm always happy to, to to talk shop and discuss some of these ideas with people. And George, thank you so much. This has been great. Uh, you, I really appreciate what you're doing for the space. Thanks, Chris. Well, let's keep building Bitcoin Cash. Right on. <laughs>